Oh, there, there it is. You're here. You are live. It is on screen. So you are all good. Fantastic. So that's good to know there's a little bit of a delay there as well. <clears throat> so I'll try not to speak ahead of the slides too much here. But um, we, we had to uh, rearrange the, the order here today. And I'm a little sad to be going after that fantastic presentation by Nitty, especially since so much of what I'm going to be talking about is based on my own opinion and is not based in any scientific fact or study whatsoever. So you are getting just advice from experience and really just think of it as this as Owen sharing with you what seems to work for me. And hopefully you can get some wisdom from it and screen it through your own filters and throw out the bad, but, but keep the good. And uh, I'm hoping that there will be some, some goodness in here. So with that, I mean, I'm, I'm a big music fan and I'm, I'm breaking my own rules here by speaking to the audience and knowing the audience because I'm using a reference here that is probably lost on many of you. Uh, what qualifies me to speak about design? Uh, what is it that I'm going to say that you don't already know? And, and how did we get to this point where I'm the person that is um, doing this presentation? Basically, why me? And uh, to answer that, uh, you know, first, it's a great question. So let's ask Kate. She's the one that, that asked me to speak here. And I think, uh, I think she's questioning that herself here. Hopefully that gift came through. It did, and I'm, I'm laughing out loud even though I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... What qualifies me? You know, I, I, I don't know that I'm any more qualified than anyone else, than anyone else that, that finds themselves into any kind of a design role. Um, I think a lot of this extends beyond just my life as a, a senior manager. Uh, a lot of it extends beyond my life as a, an instructional designer or a trainer or a facilitator for 30 plus plus years. It extends throughout my whole life. My my wife, uh, when COVID first hit, we'd had this discussion for many years, but she finally said, you know, our bathroom just really, it makes no sense. It's U-shaped. We have two doors going into it. It just makes no sense. We need to do something about that. So here you can see uh, we've ripped it apart. We've redone plumbing. We've moved things around. We've already walled in one of the doors that, that sat over here. Um, and we just had a lot of questions, right? The flow didn't work. It's U-shaped with two doors. There isn't a shower separate from the bathtub. Um, there's not a pocket door around the toilet. So there's no privacy when you're in this huge bathroom from, from anybody else. Uh, it's, it's not very functional. So we went to work, uh, created some design. This, of course, has nothing to do with learning. But the, the idea here is just to show you that design can and inspiration can be found everywhere. So this is the uh, the end result of our of our COVID bathroom. And it is like a sanctuary. This is the favorite thing that we put in the bathroom. My wife loves this. It's like a, a I made this as a, a makeup stand kind of desk. Uh, the mirror that you see above there is actually a TV mirror that I also built. So Design and the way that we show good design and good practice can be anywhere and can be applied to anything. So as in life, so in work. I'm going to give you some more life examples, but I want you to think about this from the parallels of work. Think of my wife as the boss. She comes to me and she says, I need you. To, here's the request. <laughs> and, and how often do we find ourselves in a situation where we're just designing to the request but not putting any more thought into it than just that. So she'll say, I want a peppermint fence. By the way, this is my street at Christmas. Um, we have a 60 foot boom lift being delivered tomorrow to start putting up lights. It's that time of year and it gets very busy, but my wife will come and say, I need a peppermint fence. And we say, no problem. Here you go. And then she'll say something a little more, uh, absurd to me, like, I need marshmallow snowmen. <laughs> I'm like, okay, seriously? I have no idea how I'm going to make that. But after a few years, I'm walking through a Home Depot and I see some round uh, styrofoam coolers 
And one of them was tipped upside down from the others. And I went, oh, look, if I put one on top of the other and cut them right there and then fill that space in and round the edges, I've got marshmallows and I can make a marshmallow snowman. That thing my wife has been wanting for years. So here you go, a marshmallow snowman. The, the hot cocoa pond next to it was a bonus and really just an excuse so I could use a fog machine sometime uh, other than just Halloween. But then she'll say, okay, cotton candy. And again, how often are we in organizations where the requests just seem to be more and more difficult or more and more challenging, but we just jump into it and say, that's what you want, that's what you're gonna get. Um, and so we just, we just fill the work. And the results can be good, they certainly fit the request, but are we doing the right thing for the learner? And are we taking different views into consideration? We tend to focus so much on the learner, and that's not a bad thing, but the traditional focus is just the learner needs. What does the learner need to do? At the end of this training, participants should be able to do what, right? How often have we heard that within our industry? and focus on just an experience. And experience is great. I mean, we just heard a lot about the, the importance of creating those experiences, those, those learning moments, and I believe in them 100%. But I think there's also a couple of additional perspectives that we can take that will enhance that a little bit further when we make our design choices. So really, this isn't about how you structure the learning. I'm, I'm going to focus strictly on design choices. And this really came out of a conversation that I was having with Kate, where she talked about um, my seven taps courses. She saw one that I was showing to her and she said, that looks like one of yours. Your courses always have a, a certain look and feel that just is appealing, that just seems to resonate, that helps the learning. So my focus today is to talk to you about how I get beyond just this perspective, that square in the middle with the little X. We're trying to get to that sweet spot, but that whole plane represents kind of the learner perspective. And, and in geometry, if you want to find a point in three-dimensional space, it takes three planes. You have to see where the X and the Y and the Z all intersect together. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about not just the X, we'll touch on the learner for a moment, but I really wanna dive into the Y and the Z as things to consider when you're making your design choices. So design for the learner, learner's perspective, that's a great thing. The learner has a goal or the organization has a goal for the learner. We absolutely have to take those into consideration. And I've heard things like, that's great. And that's why micro learning doesn't work because micro learning doesn't give you an experience. I can't learn from just watching something. Micro learning can't teach you technology. I'm not gonna learn a system or an application in micro learning. It's not learning if I can't demonstrate competence. These are all things that I've heard. And yet here I'm going to show you, this is a YouTube short from one of my heroes, uh, Leila Garini. I think she uh, teaches uh, in Vienna. And we're just gonna watch this video. It's less than a minute. And tell me if you learned something. If there's supposed to be sound on, there's no sound coming through, just FYI. Oh, okay. So what she's showing you is that in a column or in a row, you can just click in the empty cell and hit Alt equal, and you will automatically get the sum calculation. Um, so I was, I was worried the audio wasn't going to come through. This is that bad lip syncing moment that we talked about, Christopher. So thank you for- That's for fine. I know. told you I am at the ready. All right. So if I just continue to play it through here, what you're going to see is that she also shows, you know what, you can just highlight all of the data and include the empty cells next to it. And Alt equal once gives you all the calculations. So here we go. She used Control A to highlight everything. She's going to hold Shift arrow down and Shift arrow over to get those additional columns. And now that that's all selected, Alt equal and look at all those sum equations that popped right in. So less than a minute, it's teaching technology, 
and it's a very targeted, very specific shortcut. Is this micro learning? Give me a give me a heart or a thumbs up if you think this is micro learning, and if you think it addresses some of these concerns or barriers that we often hear on as to why micro learning can't be used in a specific situation. Christopher, you're going to have to help me out here if I'm getting any because I can't see them. <laughs> I'm getting lots of 100, 1,000% 1, yeses. Perfect, perfect. So micro learning, again, it can be in multiple formats, but the design of this is really smart because it's focused in on just a piece of an application. It's not trying to teach you everything, but it's designed with the learner in mind. Oh, here we go, back into it. So design for your audience. I think that this is such an important thing. And I'm I'm probably going to throw some myths in here, but these are some of the things that, that I look for when I think about uh, who is my audience? What do they know already? What are their attitudes or opinions? What are their needs, desires, expectations? What are their priorities? What is their preferred delivery or interaction style? Uh, not learning style, very different things. I want to be sure that I'm, I'm clear on that. Audience profile as well includes how many people is this going to be distributed to? Is this a small thing? Is this a large thing? Is this global? Is it internal to a company? Is it external and outward facing? What's the attention span of my target audience? Are they decision makers? I may need to put some different content in here and design for that. And what are the other socio-demographics I might want to consider? Are there any? And this is just the beginning. I mean, there are so many things that you can ask yourself about the audience. And I think that most people in the industry already do this. This is the thing that we tend to be very good at. Who is our audience? What do they need? Those are the constant questions that we ask ourselves. And that will drive design decisions. So here's an example of a course that I made in, in Seven Taps. And without telling you, who I was designing this for. I want you just to look at it as I click through and then type into the comments just a, a basic description or a, a generic, I mean, put people in a bucket, but just tell me as a bucket who you think this was designed for, and then I'll give you the specific information. So this is about Hangul, which is the Korean alphabet. I'll click through these fairly quickly so that you can just get an idea for the design. It breaks things down. There's audio here. This pronounces it very slowly and then quickly. So it breaks it down into the two components. Han, gul, hangul. Repeats that several times in both a woman's voice and in a man's voice. I'll continue to click through here. So you can see the images. You can see where there's no images. You can see when there are GIFs or GIFs, depending on which camp you're in. I don't want to alienate anybody here. Oh, don't start that war. <laughs> All right. So I'll click through a few more here so you can get a feel for it. Again, focus on the images that I'm using here. This is Anyang Haseo, means hello or hi in Korean. It can also imply, are you at peace? So what a lovely way to say hello. I think it's a beautiful language. And then we try it out, listen to it. This is 20 seconds of it saying, broken down, an, yang, ha, se, yo, anyang haseo, anyang haseo. And then a man's voice, and then again in a woman's voice. And then it gives you an opportunity to repeat it where it's anyang haseo, long pause, Anyang Haseo, long pause, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of the design of the course. And you see images again. Pay attention to those images. I'm going to click through some here very quickly uh, to get to letters. Um, when I get to the letters in the alphabet, the images change a little bit here because what we're learning is the character B looks like a bed with a post at either end and sounds similar to the B in bed, right? So the image now is matching a letter so that you're learning the letter. Panels on a door. You should all know what sound that now makes. Looks just like a G in gun. Makes that similar English gus sound. Looks like a person wearing a hat. What sound do you think it makes? 
Looks like a jellyfish. Sounds like an English J. So before I get into the next slide, who do you think this was designed for? If you had to describe the audience, what is their age? What's the intent of this? And, and I'll tell you in a moment, and we'll see if it if you think that it was designed appropriately for that audience. What are we getting here, Christopher? We are getting teens and young adults, early first time English speakers, potentially American, um, but a lot of young adults, millennials, uh, Gen Z trying to learn new languages. That is what we're getting. And this is so, so very close to, to the actual audience. This was designed for interns that were joining us at Samsung Austin Semiconductor to begin their internship where they would be working potentially with uh, Korean expats here in the factory in Austin, Texas. So being able to say hello, hi, yes, no, in Korean, in the language of some of the people that they would have to work with, it created a, an opportunity for those interns to feel closer to uh, many of the people that they were working with and or reporting to. And they just found the whole style to be fun and engaging. Right. So do you feel like that was, excuse me, uh, designed well for that specific audience? And if so, what specifically do you think was a good fit? What do we got coming up, Christopher? We're getting lots of yeses. Uh, some of the building community and cohesion, uh, short, simple instructions, some of the pop culture references along the way, Definitely. The re repetition. Those, perfect. Perfect. And those were all specific design choices, right? Having the opportunity to practice within a micro learning. So that, again, it's that argument about, well, you can't do application, but you can, um, there's even a test at the end where you can be graded on, do you recognize uh, this this letter, what sound does it make? Which letter does it most closely uh, resemble? So the testing is there, the repetition is there, the references to pop culture that will resonate with the audience. Um, not mnemonic recognition, but tying the unfamiliar with the familiar. I don't know what this letter is, but if I see that in the future, I know, oh, that's the jellyfish, that's the j sound in Hangul in the Korean language. So the other piece though, when I, and this is coming back to that perspectives, right? What are my needs? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I'll let you just enjoy this Michael Scott, uh, GIF GIF first, this Giffy and a Jiffy. So, so yeah, I don't need to be liked. I just need to be praised. So remember that at the end of the presentation. You don't have to like me or what I had to say today, but you can give me a little praise. So what about your needs? This is a perspective, I think, when we make design choices that we often leave out. And so I'm going to come back to if this first perspective is who is our audience, this next perspective that we now have an intersection with that is what are we trying to accomplish in and how does that guide our design choices? So what do I mean by that? What are you trying to accomplish can be, you can use it as your purpose statement, but it's influence. Am I trying to influence a certain behavior? Am I trying to get decision makers to make a specific choice or to gain consensus? Am I trying to inspire people or motivate them? Is it to inform them and just raise some awareness? Or is it to actually educate them at a deeper level? Or do I want them to take what I've educated them on and have them apply it and actually train them to do something? Or is it a combination of multiple things? Oftentimes in our training, it's not one thing that we're trying to do. It may be I want to inform people, raise awareness, and motivate them to take action, which means they need to know what actions they can take, right, and how to do those things. Um, so that drives a, a big part of my design thinking of my design decisions. Storytelling is impactful. I will try to, to tell stories to hit that purpose. If I can work a story and I know it's going to create connections. Stories create connection. 
I just want you to remember that stories create connection. Connection stirs interest. Interest, when you tell it with passion, and passion doesn't mean that you're necessarily presenting it. It's the emotional language that you use. It's the emotion and the imagery that you choose. All of that gains attention. And attention, when combined with interest, makes it memorable. So memorable training leads to actions. Images, I love images. I always work in images into my presentations. Images tell stories. So what do you feel? Everybody type in, what do you feel when you see this picture? Do we have pretty good consensus here coming up? Yep, lots of happiness. Lots of happiness. Both, okay, both in emojis and chat. All right, let's try this one. What does this guy feel? Give me, give me some different words here. What are you seeing? Lots of anger and rage. Anger, rage. But we're starting to see a difference in the words that are coming up. They're similar. They're related. But with the happiness, I tend to get consensus with that first one. With this one, there's a little more ambiguity. Let's try yeah. this one. First word that comes to mind. Sad, despair, worry. Right. So Conflicted. I bring this up because, again, this is a part of choosing and making design selections. If I want somebody to interpret the, the image the way that it promotes what I'm trying to accomplish, I need to be sure that it's accompanied with something that helps the individual interpret it the right way, either before the image comes up or with the image at the time so that it sets the stage for the right interpretation. Left on its own, a picture will tell a story, but we have to be careful that it's telling the exact story that we want it to tell. So if I say something to you like, picture a time when you just felt at peace and then show you this image. Now you interpret this as peace and peaceful and, and bliss. It's closer to that exact thing that I wanted you to feel. So again, think about that as you make your design choices. How does imagery help reinforce what you're trying to do, but more importantly, uh, also how, how can you make sure that it's being interpreted the right way? I know we're on limited time here, so I'm gonna try and blow through a couple of these very quickly. You can see that that's what happened in this. I was trying to not just inspire, but motivate people to make changes. So I start out with a little information about plastic is everywhere. Why is it there? I'm showing, you know, it's in the clothing, something a little funny, something that should resonate with people because we've all shopped and we've all picked and purchased things in these containers. And then we start to shock you a little bit with it's in our bloodstreams. Um, that's right. It's, it's found food, water, and now human blood. How much of it? A credit card's worth every week. That's how much we inhale and ingest. So in this particular course, and it goes on, obviously this is all leading up from educating to motivating so that people will change behavior. And I think Kate can attest that this actually worked. One of her colleagues um, still uses this course to, to talk about, and I think he changed some of his own behaviors. The last plane that I just want to touch on very quickly is designing for the technology, right? You have to design so that it fits the space, whether that's mobile, whether that's PC. We have to consider all of those spots to hit the sweet spot. What is the format that we're going to deliver the training in? Is it mobile, PC? Is this a video on mobile? Is it a video for PC? Is it web-based training? Is it virtual? Is that virtual live or is that virtual asynchronous? What is, how is this going to be displayed? So here's your last sort of quiz question, which is what was this designed in? What was the tool that I used to create this thing? And how was I going, how are users going to access this thing? So this is a movie. There's no sound in it this time. Thank goodness. So you can just watch what's happening as I click through here. This was me just clicking the answers. I was not actually answering them honestly. All right, as you start to figure out what this was designed in and what tool it was designed for, type those in. Christopher, you can tell me what the results are coming in. Lots of 
seven taps and desktop PowerPoint. I'm getting some PowerPoints, some stuff about mobile. All right. This was designed in Storyline and it was for a block and rise. And it was designed at exactly the dimensions that you saw. So my design choice in this case was I'm not going to use a default slide which is what Storyline does. It defaults you to the six by nine or, or four by three ratio, whatever the other ratio are. I, I, I never pay attention to the ratios because I'm always going to customize it. This one was 1000 by 400. So it's a banner. And what you can see is as I play this, whoops, let me back up here. As I play this movie, you can see this is the course that it sits in. And you wouldn't be able to tell it from any other rise uh, block because it fits nicely within there. It doesn't take up the space of a slide. I'm not going to let that whole movie play. We'll skip out here to the end. You can see the end of it gives you your, your score and then you can continue on and away you go. So it fits nicely within. This is another storyline block within that same. This is part of rise. This is part of rise. This is storyline. So design for the method that you're going to be communicating it. This was obviously designed for seven taps. I mean, it's right in there on the graphics. These are both GIFs or GIFs. Again, not going to have that argument with you. But um, how did I create these GIFs or GIFs? And who was my intended audience? Go ahead and type in your answers. And I swear we're almost done here. What are we getting? How did I make these? I'm seeing Canva, PowerPoint, and audience adolescence. <laughs> these were absolutely in PowerPoint. And it was actually just a short, quick primer for people who didn't understand that. I mean, what, look at what this is showing you. It's showing you where to click on something where to do something. It was really a general audience for anybody that needed to create GIFs or GIFs in PowerPoint. The first part was the, uh, the PowerPoint piece of it. The second ones in blue were about how you then import those and add them within seven taps. So it'd be anybody using seven taps. So at the end, just remember the three Ps. It's the people, it's your purpose, and it's the program that you're designing it for. How is it going to be distributed? And as long as you do those three things and, and bring in those additional viewpoints, it'll really help guide that focus to hit the sweet spot in your design. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Owen. Can we get some rounds of emojis for that? I love the thing that I really liked uh, in terms of some of the things you were focusing on is the intentionality behind it and really being thoughtful and considering, you know, how you're designing not on a multi dimensional level. I think sometimes we design in 1D or 2D um, when really we need to be designing in 3D and taking all that into consideration. So thanks for the multitude of examples and also the thoughtfulness behind it, Owen. I think, it. yeah, I think the big Everybody, one for me is for just it. always remembering what is my, it's not just the audience, but what is my purpose? What do I want them to, to not just do, but how can I inspire them? Uh, actually, yeah. my whole training career started with a sales trainer position. And I immediately saw that the line is blurred between sales and training because it's about yeah. motivation. Yep. And, inspiration. Well, and I think it's, it's that healthy tension between what do they need and what do we need to accomplish through what we need and finding that right balance. I think you can't swing too far on either end of the pendulum uh, or, or you'll either end up creating content that isn't of adding value for the organization. You go the other way and it's adding no value to the user. So I think finding that right balance is key.